In chapter 18, we are going to begin our study of the cardiovascular system. We will start off examining the blood. This chapter will focus on the blood and later on we will discuss the blood vessels and heart. Cardiology is the study of the heart. Angiology is the study of arteries, veins, and lymph vessels. And hematology is the study of blood. If we look at the formed elements of the blood, as shown here, we can see the blood contains red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and we will examine characteristics of each. First, let's look at some basic functions of the blood. Our blood is important in the transportation of many substances, like dissolved gases, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic waste products. The blood also defends against toxins or pathogens and can even restrict fluid loss at the site of an injury. In addition, the blood is important in the maintenance of homeostasis. For example, via pH, ion composition, and body temperature. The basic characteristics of blood are shown here. Blood is a liquid connective tissue which constitutes approximately 8% of the human body mass. Blood is four to five times more viscous than water. Blood is also somewhat sticky and has a salt concentration of about 0.9%. Blood temperature is slightly above our normal body temperature. The blood pH is slightly al alkaline with a pH in the range of 7.35 to 7.45 and blood volumes range from four to six liters. Men have about five to six liters of blood and women have four to five liters of blood. Blood is also a heterogeneous mixture consisting of plasma and formed elements. The non-living matrix is the plasma and the formed elements of the blood are the plasma proteins. Here we can see the composition of blood. Water is the primary component of blood plasma. Plasma proteins are in solution and they form insoluble fibers like those in other connective tissues, like elastin and collagen fibers. On average, plasma contains protein, which is almost five times the concentration of our interstitial fluids. The liver synthesizes and releases more than 90% of all plasma proteins. And here you can see some of the plasma proteins that are found in our blood. Albumin is the most abundant group of proteins and constitutes around 55 to 60 percent of all plasma proteins. Albumins also contribute to the osmotic pressure exerted by blood plasma and can serve as binding proteins. Globulins account for around 35 percent of the plasma proteins and are important in attacking pathogens, while others are important in the transport by binding to ions, hormones, lipids, and other compounds. Fibrinogens are a clotting protein and they account for around 5% of the plasma proteins. Under certain conditions, 
for example, under when you're injured, these soluble proteins interact to form large insoluble strands of fibrin, which forms the basic framework of a blood clot. The remaining 1% of proteins are active and inactive enzymes and hormones, and their concentrations will vary. There is other solutes that make up our blood plasma. Dissolved solutes are generally present in plasma in concentrations similar to those of interstitial fluids. However, there is differences in the concentration of nutrients, waste products, and respiratory gases that can exist between arterial blood and venous blood. So you can see that there's also electrolytes, organic nutrients, and organic waste products. Major plasma electrolytes include sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarb, and so on. Organic nutrients are used for ATP production, growth, and maintenance of cells. This category can include lipids, carbohydrates, and amino acids. Organic waste products are carried to sites of breakdown or excretion, like urea, uric acid, and bilirubin, and even ammonium ions. The formed elements are blood cells and cell fragments suspended within the blood plasma. The formed elements are erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. Erythrocytes are also known as our red blood cells, and they are the most abundant blood cell and are specialized for the transport of oxygen. Leukocytes are also known as white blood cells, participate in the body's defense mechanisms and are divided into five classes, each with a slightly different function. Thrombocytes are also known as platelets. These are not true cells, but instead are only small, membrane-bound cellular fragments that contain enzymes and other substances important for the process of blood clotting. Now we will examine the formation of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Hematopoiesis is shown here. And you can see that the process begins from a multipotent stem cell. This process, prior to birth, occurs in a number of tissues, beginning with the yolk sac of the developing embryo and continuing in the fetal liver, spleen, lymphatic tissue, and eventually the red bone marrow. Following birth, this process occurs in the red marrow in the medullary cavity of long bones throughout childhood. In adulthood, the process is largely restricted to the cranial and pelvic bones, the vertebrae, the sternum, and the proximal ends of the femur and humerus. Production of erythrocytes is known as erythropoiesis, which is shown here. This occurs in the red marrow of flat bones like the sternum, ribs, skull bones, scapula, pelvis, and portions of the vertebrae, and the proximal ends of limb bones. It begins with a hemocytoblast, a stem cell within the red bone marrow that multiplies by mitosis to form myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. 
the myeloid stem cells differentiate into cells committed to become red blood cells called proerythroblasts. The proerythroblast divides by mitosis to produce an early erythroblast. The early erythroblast, also known as a bacillic erythroblast, has ribosome synthesis occurring, which results in an accumulation of hemoglobin forming the late erythroblast. And this is where rapid accumulation of hemoglobin starts to compress the organelles. When it gets to the stage of a normoblast, we see compression and expulsion of the nucleus and organelles. And this is where the cell takes on the characteristic biconcave shape. The resulting non-nucleated cell is called a reticulocyte. The reticulocytes squeeze through the capillary walls within the bone marrow and enter the circulation to mature. After 24 hours of circulation, the cell becomes a mature erythrocyte. Regulation of this process occurs via erythropoietin which is produced primarily by the kidneys. EPO is produced when red blood cell counts are low, as in anemia, if there is a reduced oxygen concentration, as in hypoxia, if there is insufficient hemoglobin amounts, or when blood flow to the kidneys is compromised. The production of leukocytes is also known as leukopoiesis. This also occurs in the red bone marrow, but is initiated by a variety of cytokines and released when infection occurs in the body rather than by the hormone erythropoietin. This process also begins with a multipotent stem cell. You can see a, hemato, a hemocytoblast, which differentiates into myeloid and lymphoid stem cells. The myeloid stem cells then divide by mitosis to form myeloblasts and monoblasts. A progenitor cell which is stimulated by colony stimulating factor, results in the myeloblast, which can differentiate further into neutrophils, isonophils, and basophils. Monoblasts form the monocytes. The lymphoid stem cells give rise to the agranulated lymphocytes. Production of platelets, or thrombocytes, is shown here. This also occurs in the red bone marrow, but is initiated by thrombopoietin rather than EPO or cytokines. Again, we start with hemocytoblasts, which differentiate into myeloid and lymphoid stem cells. Myeloid stem cells further divide to become megakaroblasts, which mature to form megokaracytes. Megokaracytes are enormous multinucleated cells which pinch off membrane-bound packets containing enzymes and other chemicals necessary for blood clotting. Once in circulation, these packets are known as platelets. And here is a summary of the formed elements which we just discussed. Now let's examine erythrocytes in a little bit more detail. Here we can see some of the characteristics of our red blood cells. Red blood cells are biconcave discs which lack a nucleus. 
Red blood cells are small. They range in size from seven to eight micrometers. Red blood cells can form stacks to ease the flow of blood, blood cells through narrow vessels. An entire stack can pass along a blood vessel only slightly larger than the diameter of a single red blood cell, whereas individual cells would bump the walls, bang together, and form a log jam that could restrict or even prevent blood flow. Red blood cells are very flexible because they contain the protein spectrin, which allows them to pass through tiny capillaries that are generally smaller in diameter than a red blood cell. And they also are the most numerous formed element of whole blood. Because red blood cells do not possess a nucleus and have lost most of their organelles, red blood cells are incapable of performing metabolism or repair processes and therefore they only live on average about 120 days. Red blood cells contain large amounts of a pigmented transport protein known as hemoglobin. Here you can see the hemoglobin structure. Each red blood cell contains 200 to 300 million hemoglobin molecules. For diagnostic purposes, hemoglobin levels are reported in grams per deciliter. The normal range for males is 14 to 18 grams per deciliter, and for females, is 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. Each hemoglobin demonstrates the quaternary level of protein structure and is composed of two alpha polypeptide chains and two beta polypeptide chains. In the middle of each polypeptide chain is an iron containing heme group. The iron of each heme can bind one molecule of oxygen. When heme is bound to oxygen, it is called oxyhemoglobin, and the blood becomes bright red. When heme is not bound to oxygen, it is called deoxyhemoglobin, and the blood becomes dark red, as you can see in the figure. To a lesser degree, hemoglobin can bind to carbon dioxide, but it cannot bind to the iron of the heme. Instead, it binds to the polypeptide chains so that it does not compete with oxygen for binding. Hemoglobin bound to carbon dioxide is called carbaminohemoglobin and has a distinctive bluish color. The life cycle of red blood cells is shown here. The body produces approximately 2 to 3 million red blood cells per second. After being released from the bone marrow, red blood cells will travel more than 700 miles through the blood vessels. Dying red blood cells are phagocytized by macrophages located within the liver, spleen, and bone marrow. Once phagocytized, the plasma membrane of the red blood cell ruptures, releasing the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin molecules are broken down into globin, which is the polypeptide chains that are further broken down into amino acids, and into a heme group, which is further broken down into iron that is stored in the liver, and the green pigment called biliverdin. The amino acids from the globin are recycled and used by the body cells to make more hemoglobin or other important body proteins. Iron from the heme is stored in the liver or transported to body cells by transferrin. The biliverdin, also from the heme, is converted to bilirubin 
and transported to the liver for further processing. Most of the bilirubin is used in the liver to produce bile, which is later excreted into the intestines. If the normal breakdown of bilirubin is disrupted, it may accumulate in the skin and sclera of the eye. And this yellow, yellowish discoloration, discoloration of the skin and eyes is called jaundice. If the red blood cells are not phagocytized, the hemoglobin chains break down in the bloodstream and are later eliminated in the urine rather than the feces. When abnormally large numbers of red blood cells break down in the bloodstream, the urine may turn red or brown in color. Now let's discuss some diagnostic tests associated with erythrocytes. Hematocrit is also known as packed cell volume and is the percent of red blood cells in whole blood. In males, the hematocrit will, will range from 40 to 54 percent and in females from 37 to 47 percent. A complete blood count, also known as a CBC, gives the kinds and number of cells present in a whole blood sample. Hemoglobin concentration is hemoglobin levels that are reported in grams per deciliter. Here you can see some of the basic red blood cell tests and the related terminology like hematocrit, hemoglobin concentration, MCH, MCV, red blood cell count, and reticulocyte count. Some erythrocyte disorders are shown here. If you have a decreased red blood cell count, that would be anemia. There is several different types of anemia. A plastic anemia is when the bone marrow fails to function. And it could be due to some damage from radiation, drug use, antibiotics, toxins, or some other type of poison, as an example. Hemorrhagic anemia results from excessive blood loss. Hemolytic anemia is an increase in the rate of destruction of red blood cells via hemolysis. We can also have decreased hemoglobin levels, such as that occurs in iron deficiency or pernicious anemia. In iron deficiency, the lack of iron results in small pale erythrocytes called microcytes. Pernicious anemia is where there is a decrease in the total red blood cell numbers because vitamin B12 may be deficient or there could be a deficiency of intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 absorption and this produces macrocytes. Hemoglobin can also be abnormal. Thalassemia is a genetically inherited abnormal hemoglobin synthesis, typically seen in people of Mediterranean ancestry. Sickle cell anemia is a genetically inherited abnormal hemoglobin synthesis, which typically occurs in people of African ancestry. Polycythemia is where you have an excess red blood cell count, which causes the blood to become even more viscous and flow very sluggishly. Primary polycythemia often results from bone marrow cancer or a genetic disorder. Secondary polycythemia results from low oxygen concentrations, such as high altitudes, lung disease, or even smoking.
It can also be caused by blood doping and blood transfusion. Here you can see sickle cell anemia and the sickling or S-shaped in the red blood cell. Now let's examine the leukocytes and platelets. Leukocyte characteristics are shown here. Leukocytes are less numerous than red blood cells. They also possess distinct nuclei and can therefore perform metabolism. They can leave the circulation. Once outside the bloodstream, white blood cells are attracted to potential infections and possible injuries by positive chemotaxis, which means they're moving toward a chemical stimuli. And white blood cells also lack hemoglobin pigment. Here you can see how white blood cells can leave circulation and move about via emigration. They can exit the blood vessels and move through the connective tissue going towards the site of injury. Leukocytes like eosinophils and neutrophils, which we will examine next, have granules and they can release chemicals from their granules that will ultimately destroy pathogens and are also capable of the process of phagocytosis. An agranular leukocyte, the monocyte, can differentiate into a macrophage which can then phagocytize a pathogen. If we look at the different types of leukocytes shown here, and here you can see the types of leukocytes that we just discussed. Now there is some um, mnemonic devices that can help you remember uh, the quantities of the leukocytes or whether they're granulated versus agranulated. The relative quantities never let monkeys eat bananas means the neutrophils are the most numerous and the basophils are the least numerous. Granulated versus agranulated isonophils basophils and neutrophils are granulated, monocytes and leukocyte, lymphocytes are not granulated. Here you can see some other pictures showing the types of nucleus, the color that we just discussed with the granular leukocytes. One thing to note is the eosinophils or eosinophils generally stain red. So when examining these histologically, if you see a red stained cell, it most likely is an um, eosinophil. The agranulocytes are shown here, and you can see the acorn shape of the lymphocyte and the large monocyte much larger than the uh, red blood cells surrounding it. And those are some distinctive characteristics in helping to identify the different types of leukocytes when looking at them from a slide. Leukocyte disorders are shown here. Leukopenia which is also known as leukocytopenia, is an abnormally low white blood cell count and is commonly induced by drugs, glucocorticoids, and anti-cancer agents. Leukocytosis is an increase in white blood cell count indicating an infection. Infectious mononucleosis, which is also known as the kissing disease, is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, resulting in excessive numbers of atypical 
agranulocytes. Leukemia is a cancerous condition of white blood cells and is named after the predominant cell type involved. Acute leukemia is a quick advancing cancer derived from lymphoblasts, also known as lymphoid leukemia. Chronic leukemia is a slow advancing cancer derived from late stages of myeloblast, which is also known as myeloid leukemia. Thrombocytes are, are platelets, and the characteristics of thrombocytes or platelets is shown here. Platelets are less than half the size of red blood cells. They are the second most numerous of the three formed elements. They're not true cells, but instead are cytoplasmic fragments of larger cells called megakaryocytes. The production of them is regulated by thrombopoietin, and their lifespan is only about 9 to 12 days. Blood clotting is also known as hemostasis, and the stages of blood clotting are shown here. There is first a vascular phase where smooth muscle contractions attempt to vasoconstrict blood vessels to reduce blood flow to the damaged area. This phase is stimulated by serotonin and endothelin. There is the next phase is a platelet phase, where platelets aggregate and stick to the exposed collagen fibers. This phase is enhanced by adenosine diphosphate, ADP, prostaglandins, PDGF, calcium ions, and serotonin. The next phase is the coagulation phase, which is also known as blood clotting, and is the formation of a clot, which involves two chemical pathways, an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway resulting in the conversion of soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. This phase involves the formation of prothrombinase, also known as prothrombin activator, and then involves the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, and then the conversion of soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. The next stage of blood clotting and repair involves clot retraction, where the platelets contract to pull on the surrounding fibrin strands, compacting the clot and encouraging vessel healing. Next, PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, stimulates the cell division of smooth muscle and connective tissue to rebuild the wall of the vessel. Finally, fibrinolysis is where the fibrin strands are broken by an active enzyme called plasmin. There is a number of clotting factors that are involved in this process shown here. And the clotting factors, some of these we mentioned, fibrinogen, prothrombin, um, calcium ions were noted, uh, PDGF, ADP, all of these are important in blood clotting and repair. The final phases of hemostasis that were talked about are noted here. Clot retraction, repair involving PDGF, and finally fibrinolysis. Now there is a number of clotting disorders or platelet disorders that are noted here. Thrombus is when a clot develops in an unbroken blood vessel. 
An embolus is a thrombus that is freely floating in the bloodstream. Hemophilia is a condition that involves the inability to clot because of a missing clotting factor and is a sex-linked inheritance disease. Thrombocytopenia is where you have low numbers of circulating platelets which can cause spontaneous bleeding. Another clotting disorder is impaired liver function which results in vitamin K deficiencies and therefore impaired coagulation. Disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC is a widespread clotting that results in the reduction in the amount of platelets and fibrinogen available in the blood. If the liver cannot produce more fibrinogen to keep pace, clotting abilities will decline and uncontrolled bleeding may result. Now let's examine blood typing. Blood typing is based on the presence of specific antigens, also called agglutinogens, found on the surface of red blood cells, and the presence of specific antibodies also called agglutinins in the plasma or serum. Since blood types are named according to antigens present on the red blood cell, the system is called the ABO system. The RH factor is another component and is named from its first discovery in the rhesus monkey. Here you can see the various blood types. The A blood type is where a person possesses only the A antigen on the red blood cell surface and will also possess the anti-B antibodies in their plasma. The B blood type is when a person possesses only the B antigen on the red blood cell surface and they will possess the anti-A antibody in their plasma. The AB blood type is when a person possesses both the A and B antigens on the red blood cell surface. They will possess neither the anti-A nor anti-B antibodies in their plasma. The O blood type is when a person possesses neither the A or B antigen on the red blood cell surface. And they will possess both the anti-A and anti-B antibodies in their plasma. The RH system, as I noted, is named from its first discovery in the rhesus monkey. Individuals whose red blood cells possess the D antigen are RH positive, while individuals without the D antigen are said to be RH negative. Testing blood types involves looking for the type of antigen that is present on the surface of the red blood cell. We can take a sample of known antibody, like anti-A, anti-B, or anti-D, and place an unknown blood sample in that solution of antibody and look for an agglutination or clumping reaction. If the corresponding antigen is present, then the antibody and antigen will come together and form a lock and key mechanism, and that generally will cause precipitation or agglutination of it out of solution. And you can see here the agglutination reaction in the anti-A and anti-D samples. If you look at the ABO blood typing and examine the agglutination reaction shown here for the various blood types, we can determine the blood type of the sample. In this first slide, in the top left hand side of the figure, you see an agglutination reaction in anti-A 
in the anti-A well in the anti-D well. That means this person is A positive. There is no agglutination reaction in the B well. In the second slide, the patient would be B positive. In the third slide, they would be AB positive. And in the final slide there, the person would be O negative. There is a blood typing game with a link shown here that you can play to practice the different types of blood types and being able to determine the different types of blood types. Be sure you can um, identify the various blood types as shown. And here is a summary of the ABO and RH blood types in the United States. Blood types will vary by region. Now in order for somebody to do donate blood, um, we do have what we call a universal donor and a universal recipient. The universal donor is blood type O because when this blood type is injected, it will not agglutinate because there is no antigen present. The universal recipient is blood type AB. They don't possess any antibodies, so no agglutination of cells will occur. And finally, hemolytic disease of the newborn is demonstrated here. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is when the mother is Rh negative while the baby is Rh positive. This causes hemolysis of the baby's red blood cells and even death. The first child is usually fine because there's no mixing of maternal and fetal blood during the pregnancy, but there can be during delivery, which would make the second pregnancy at a very high risk because the mother would develop antibodies against the RH positive that was introduced during delivery. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is also called erythroblastosis fatalis. And Rogam is an anti-RH gamma globulin that can be administered to the mother to prevent hemolytic disease of the newborn and clear any of those antibodies from her blood after the first pregnancy to ensure a successful second pregnancy. This concludes Chapter 18, our examination of the cardiovascular system focusing on the blood.